And it's the last one for the week. This is Business Morning Live on Channel Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening in the world of uh, oil there. Oil prices drifted uh, lower today, wiping out gains from previous session as a dollar. Uh, continue to rise on bets the U.S. Central Bank will bring forward plans to raise uh, rates to tame inflation. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures fell 26 cents to $81.33 a barrel uh, in early trade, reversing Thursday's 25 cent gain. Brent crude futures fell 25 cents to $82.62 uh, a barrel. Both contracts were poised to end the week roughly uh, unchanged after sharp moves up and down, driven by a soaring dollar and speculation on whether the Biden administration might release oil from the uh, U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve to actually cool prices. And the United Nations uh, Green Climate Fund has approved $150 million to support the African Development Bank's uh, Desert to Power initiative, which will aid uh, efforts to expand electricity access in Nigeria and 10 other uh, countries in Africa's Sahel Belt. The president of the AFDB, Kiwumi Adishina, who made this known, uh, says the, the initiative, which is part of its new deal for energy in Africa, will harness solar energy uh, source across the Sahel region and help the, the country's uh, efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals target. The Green Climate Fund is an operating entity of the financial mechanism established under the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change to assist developing countries in adaptation and mitigation practices to counter its effect. And the Edo State uh, government says it is confident that arrangement that has in, in place to make the uh, state investor friendly will increase the results in, it has recorded in improving the economy of the state. This was part of the points highlighted at a meeting between uh, the government officials and World Bank team and investors under the Edo State oil palm production uh, program in Benin City. Our correspondent Jessica Ologosera reports. The Edo State government's lunch with delegates from the World Bank and Edo State Oil Palm Production Program, ESOP Investors, gives room for the sharing of ideas and progress reports. The World Bank representative, who has had a glimpse into some of the development projects the state has initiated, finds the efforts encouraging and offers some suggestions for sustainability in agriculture noting the importance of involving the communities and the Rural Access Agriculture Markets Program, RAAMP. You can leapfrog, in a way, to the best uh, practices, uh, whether it's sustainability, whether it's uh, on the livelihoods, and also on the value chain. So we, at the bank, we can provide the RAAMP program support, but we can also provide uh, knowledge and know-how in terms of, let's think about what are the, what are the in, what's the right policies and, um, and incentives or did, that we can uh, think of to make sure that we have the enabling environment. The governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, believes that the steps the government has taken, including providing clarity on land issues and ensuring a society of law and order, would draw in more investors. So our priority number one is to make this place easy for our easier, for our own indigenous to bring money and invest. We have a huge diaspora. We keep engaging with them, talking with them, and we know and believe that they will, will be the first line in or the first in the line of investors. And we begin to see that in real estate and some other opportunities. So our goal is to continue to remove those rigidities, those things that have stopped them in the past from bringing money home. And principle to that is law and order. As it was also a think tank session, with the lunch over, work towards the development of Edo's economy continues for this group. Jessica Lubuser, Channels Television News. All right, now to our first conversation. While well, forced displacement has reached uh, record highs over the past decade, with our developing countries bearing the brunt, Africa currently hosts the highest number of people forced to flee in the world. Nearly 36 million people out of the uh, more than 84 million forced to flee due to conflict, uh, violence, persecution, and actually climate change. While humanitarian assistance has effectively supported you know, misplaced populations in the emergencies, 
A different approach is uh, needed, involving new actors, predominantly the private sector, in contributing to sustainable solutions for uh, refugees and displaced persons. It's for this reason that the Amahoro Coalition, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, a UN Refugee Agency, and the African Entrepreneur Collective uh, will convene the inaugural 36 Million Solutions Africa Private Sector Forum on Forced Displacement from 30th of November to 2nd of December 2021 in Kigali, Rwanda. To tell us more about this uh, forum is the founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, uh, Mrs. Tonyo Jarasaraki. We also have Mr. Isaac Kwakuf Fokuo, a co-founder of a Maharo Coalition, an African-led initiative convening private sector leaders to advance economic inclusion. Great to have you both on the program. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for inviting us. Okay, so I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Us. Kwaku. Uh, good morning. Well, forced displacement has reached, you know, record highs over the past decade. Can you talk to us about this inaugural forum, its theme, uh, how it came about, and the significance of this time? Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and good morning again to you and your, your listeners. Look, I, I think that the problem you highlighted, you know, I think you rightfully said it. I mean, close to 84 million people globally are displaced. Um, Africa, which represents 16 percent of the global population, um, is uh, recipient to 35 or 36 million people plus or minus. Um, this is a major problem, right? So on our continent, if we're saying that 36 million people of our fellow Africans have been forced to leave their homes uh, and they're either refugees, internally displaced, stateless, or asylum seekers, that's a problem that we need to address. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, one of the things that, you know, became very clear to us as, as with, with, with looking at this problem is that we needed to identify ways to open the tent to figure out how we can bring practical solutions to this um, to, to, to this issue. Because as you know, refugees and IDPs and, and uh, stateless persons are people who have left their homes, not by choice, but because they've been forced to do so. Um, so, you know, we chose the theme 36 million solutions as a collective response to this staggering problem. Uh, and also to ensure that, you know, we set an ambition target of response where uh, every person who is forced to leave their home because of violence, persecution, and conflict on the continent of Africa has the support, resources, and tools necessary to rebuild their lives. Um, so you ask yourself, why does private sector come in? Well, private sector comes in because private sector has a role to play in this conversation. The Africa private sector is increasingly becoming more sophisticated. And as you rightly said in your in one of the introductory remarks, there's COP26 going on. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation going around energy and climate change and everything else. And so private sector actors are increasingly becoming um, custodians and also becoming more responsible for some of the, the welfare of states in which in which they live. Uh, furthermore, we you know we believe that if private sector invests in refugees, we're also investing in solutions for local communities, for the host communities in which these forcibly displaced people are, are, are finding themselves as new homes, um, thereby fostering social cohesion um, by setting up priority programs such as education, livelihoods, and financial inclusion projects that allows for mutually beneficial shared value solutions. So really, the, the, the point of this event that we have been in Kigali from 30th November to December 2nd is to build linkages on, on common values um, and intention is to build support for the most vulnerable amongst us and do this through more, uh, multi-stakeholder solutions in a way that allows everyone uh, to make sure that we're building shared prosperity across the African continent. All right, Mr. Foko, I'll come back to you. Uh, Mrs. Sarki, I understand you recently uh, visited uh, Dagom refugee settlement in Ogoja, that's in Cross River State, and you met with you know, Cameroonian refugees. Can, can you share with us your experience there? Absolutely. It gladdened my heart to actually usher in my birthday in September with the refugees of the Adagam resettlement community at Agoja, Cross River State, where UNHCR has been working very hard, along with the Cross River State government and the NEMA, to actually resettle these refugees permanently. It was an incredible experience. Adagam is a community that is filled with vibrance and resilience as the refugees that have made their home there struggle to create a new life. I saw that COVID-19 has affected that community disproportionately, especially the women and the girls that are there who were in need of maternal and child health support, family support and timely antenatal care. In fact, on the spot, I immediately started my Wellbeing Foundation Africa's Mama Care antenatal and postnatal education, as well as our adolescents PSHE WASH. But what I saw from the logistics 
that it took for me to visit them for my birthday. And I thought I was making a huge contribution, you know, a couple of trailers of food and sort of um, sanitation and dignity items. But I could see that what I took would probably only last two days in a refugee settlement of that size. So it spurred my intention that we have to gather the private sector to act fast, to get these settlement communities back on track and to ensure that no woman, no expectant mother, no girl child, no boy, no man, no family is left behind. And that's the reason why I've joined hands with UNHCR globally, UNHCR Nigeria, and UNHCR private sector partnerships, which provides a very innovative platform to support such vulnerable communities across the continent and across the world by protecting and empowering displaced men women and youth to promote social and economic inclusion and to foster very good relationships with their local communities. No one is truly safe until everyone is safe. And I'm pleased to join UNHCR, partnering to ensure that all refugees and displaced persons have access to their basic human rights and dignities, including the right to work. The right to work. All right, uh, I can imagine how emotional it would be seeing uh, people in such a situation. Uh, but let's, uh, let me come to Mr. Foucault now. You know, we know the, that humanitarian assistance has you know, effectively supported displaced populations in emergency. So uh, why do you believe that uh, a broadened approach is needed to you know, address the, the forced uh, displacement crisis at this time? You know, a broader approach is necessary because, frankly, the gap between the needs and the resources are just too wide, right? I mean, take, for example, our governments. Our governments in Africa have historically welcomed and opened their borders to people fleeing um, from war, conflict, violence, and persecution. Um, this has happened all through, all through Africa's history. I mean, we just, we just mentioned, um, Madam Toyin just mentioned about being in, a, being in a place in Nigeria to see Cameroon refugees. Uh, governments have been hosting refugees in Africa a very, very long time. And, and we also can understand that our governments have very, very limited resources. And in Africa, you know, we, we, the, the collection of revenue for, for government to do a lot of things, including infrastructure and everything else, is quite tight. But the governments do what they can do. And then you take humanitarian organizations such as, such as the UNHCR, the UN uh, Refugee Agency, that relies entirely, almost entirely, on voluntary contributions, right? Um, the UN gets its money from people like you and I, from governments who volunteer to give money to the organization to, imp and to implement implementing partners on the ground to do their work. And, and they're stretched, and they do a fantastic job doing that. They offer emergency relief, they offer support, and they do what, whatever they can to make sure that people are, uh, have had... Have, uh, uh, um, uh, decent places to stay, decent places to live, um, have a form of education, and, and do this very well. So, but it's not enough, I said, like I said, you know, because the gap is widening. Take, for instance, Nigeria as a country. Nigeria is the largest, largest country in Africa and also the largest economy in the continent of Africa. Currently, Nigeria has over 3 million internally displaced people and another 75,000 plus refugees and asylum seekers. And many of these individuals have been in this situation, not for months, but for years. So imagine years and years of being in a situation where you have 3 million people who are internally displaced, another 75,000 that are refugees and asylum seekers. Obviously, the resources that need to go to other population is, 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 quite, is, is quite tremendous. At the same time, Nigeria also proudly happens to host some of the most vibrant and successful businesses and entrepreneurs and companies on the African continent that are very committed to social responsibility, um, impact investing, ESGs, and shared value goals. So our, our, our conversation is saying, look, let's broaden the net. Let's have this forum to unite these businesses with industry leaders alongside multi-stakeholder multi um, uh, partners from Nigeria and other parts of the continent to accelerate, pri accelerate private sector's leadership in, 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 this, um, in this conversation to drive sustainable market-based interventions, because that's the only way, uh, by having a multi-stakeholder approach, by making sure that we have governments on board with businesses, with, with um, uh, civil society and other actors, that's the only way that we can address this, this conversation in a much meaningful manner to, to close a gap between the resources and the needs that are necessary to, 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 do, to do so. I guess everyone has a collective uh, part to play in all of this, but uh, Mrs. Saraki, what role will the private sector play in helping to you know, rebuild the lives you know, of people that were forced to, you know, flee at the different uh, situations there. Absolutely. Africa's private sector is well positioned as a critical agent of productivity, prosperity and change. The private sector can invest in refugee hosting communities as partners, donors or employers. The private sector made of national, multinational companies, foundations and individuals can increase their step 
into the humanitarian relief space to support innovative responses to the urgent and critical needs of the vulnerable communities. The private sector has always been at the forefront of creating solutions that lift thousands of marginalized and underserved communities out of abject poverty, often forcibly displaced people who do represent the most vulnerable communities on our continent are overlooked. And because of that, they don't fully benefit from the innovative solutions and social investment programs that are spearheaded already by the private sector in Africa. We are facing the highest levels of forced displacement in history and in the world. And this multi-stakeholder approach that Isaac has mentioned is critically needed now. You know, we can thrive through innovative shared value partnerships. We can can rebuild the lives of the people who were forced to flee by harnessing their capacity and turning their displacement challenges into development opportunities. In recent years, we've entered the era of increased social responsibility and awareness. And that transition involved new business practices and business partnership models, which meant that this particular topic, generating revenues while contributing to tackling displacement challenges is a challenge that we need to take now. The needs that have been created from the large flow of displaced populations into a host country can also bring opportunities. So I'm hoping that the private sector will brace up to identify these opportunities, open up markets, upgrade infrastructure, create jobs and income for the displaced population, giving them a sense of significance, self-reliance and belonging. You know, in as much as we promote the principle of non-refoulement, helping refugees to contribute to the local economies of the host community communities will allow them either to become full parts of those host communities and play their part, or should the reasons why they were forced to flee improve in their host countries, put them in a better economic position to choose to return if that is their choice. So we need to make use of the market systems that offer greater access to products and services that will improve both the quality of life of the displaced person the populations, and even that of the host communities. We have seen, for instance, improvement in wash facilities in the displaced community resettlement camps also improve those of host communities. Particularly, I'd like to put the focus on women. Helping women will help to sustain the dignity of families and people that are already in a fragile situation. I would love to see training, apprenticeships, on the job training to displaced persons, to upgrade their skills so that they are competent in a given job and at their current location. I believe that if we intentionally through the private sector, begin to plan around our refugee and displaced communities. We will have a greater pool of human resources to contribute to our own local economies. All right, Mrs. Saki. Well, uh, Mr. Kwakuyo, the, the event kicks off uh, from the 30th, but uh, who should attend uh, the Africa Private Sector Forum, you know, on forced displacement? And what can they expect to actually get out of this forum? Yeah, we welcome anyone and everyone who is interested in, the conversation, in, interested in this conversation in the ecosystem we're talking about, which is initially the private sector. So business leaders, industry leaders, sorry, business industry leaders, thought leaders, um, foundations, philanthropists um, from Africa um, are welcome to the table to have these conversations to help us commit mechanisms to support uh, the force displaced on the Afri African continent. And, and what do, can they expect to uh, we, um, get out of the events? Like a couple of things. I think, first of all, they can expect an intimate gathering that is quite unique in um, creating a network effect for them to influence decisions in this, in, 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 in this conversation in this space. I think secondly, there's an opportunity to connect with policymakers, business leaders and, and uh, thought leaders to shape the future of Africa philanthropy. You know, as I say sometimes, you know, Africa has amazing, we have amazing people who give a lot of charity. Uh, and we have a lot of people who also are very philanthropic, but we do need to widen the number of philanthrop philanthropists that we have on the continent. And I think this conversation that we're going to have at the end of the month presents an opportunity to do so. Uh, so also, I, I'd say that it, people can, can, can appreciate that when they come to the event, they're going to learn how to build resilient business models to help transform refugee and, and IDP host, uh, host areas to thriving markets. You know, the space we're talking about, you know, just to give an example, the IFC did a study in Kenya a couple of years ago, looking at Kakuma, one of the refugee camps in, in, in Kenya. And one of the things that they came out with is that if Kakuma 
uh, and, the, and the surrounding host community was 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 a county in Kenya. It would be the eleventh la largest eleventh um, largest uh, county in Kenya, which has I believe forty seven counties. So these these areas uh, present significant opportunity for um, for uh, market based uh, um, market based ideas that the private sector in collaboration with with other stakeholders can actually um, create environments to, to thrive. Um, and also, I think also another thing to expect is that. Uh, folks from okay. connected organizations with um, with common goal of alleviating this police crisis on the African continent. All right, all right, uh, uh, Mrs. Saraki, I'd like to get you, you know, final uh, thoughts here. You know, we know that uh, people, you know, getting displaced uh, all over the world is a big uh, problem, and actually solving this problem takes a, a lot of uh, effort. I'd like to get your final thoughts before I let you uh, you go. Well, what I would say is that with 3 million refugees across Nigeria and with over 75,000 new refugees and displaced persons just in the last month, I would hope that the private sector from Nigeria and across Africa, as we go into Kigali for this conference, will actually consider the creation of economic zones with preferential trade access for refugee-made goods, where domestic as well as foreign investors can relocate supply chains. I'm hoping that out of this conference, the private sector will better understand the long-term needs of displaced persons and host communities as potential consumers and clients so that we are well prepared for the risks. I'm looking forward to the synergy and leverages okay. such as public-private partnerships. All right. All right. I'd like to thank you both for coming uh, on the program. Uh, Mr. Tony Saraki, founder of Wellbeing Foundation Africa, and Mr. Isaac Kwaku, uh, for co uh, co founder of Mahara Coalition. Thank you both for coming on the program. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Now, uh, after the break, uh, we look at global economic matters as it affects Nigeria. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning Live on Channels Television. Well, to our next uh, conversation, let's get an update on happenings in the global oil market and the financial market as well. We have uh, Akintoye, Uyelaku Investment Analyst at Quadris uh, Asset Management, uh, joining us on the program. Great to have you on the program. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, the global... Hello? Are you able to hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you just great. Um, so the global oil market has remained uh, you know, resilient so far after uh, suffering a dip following the comments of the U.S. government to raise output, you know, given the inflationary pressures that uh, the economy is currently facing. In your view, what has been the major driver of the, of the rebound? Uh, yes, uh, basically, I mean, there are several factors that we could attribute to uh, the resilience in the oil sector. And one of it is the growing rate of vaccination, which has helped to uh, keep the market very strong in terms of demand outlook. Uh, as vaccination continues to improve, we have seen more businesses uh, being opened across countries, uh, supporting demand. And despite the fact that the US is a major producer, I mean, the largest uh, producer of oil in the world, uh, it has that potential to disrupt the market. Uh, we have seen that even after the comment that was made by, uh, by Biden, we saw that uh, there was a signing of um, there was the approval of the uh, infrastructure uh, uh, bill, which was $1 trillion. So this kind of like drew a positive sentiment for the oil market. And we saw uh, buying interest across oil commodities. And in addition to that, we have also seen major roles played by, uh, by OPEC plus cartel. Um, OPEC has been able to um, agree with its members to continue to gradually um, return to, uh, uh, to the normal level of production after it has installed um, quotas um, a, starting from uh, the peak of the pandemic. So we have seen OPEC playing a major role, uh, despite the fact that it controls just uh, below 40% uh, of the market share. OPEC Plus has played a major role in ensuring that uh, the oil market is not oversupplied. And we have seen oil ascending from as low as uh, $15 per barrel to as high as $80 per barrel. So I'll say these factors are responsible for uh, driving the uh, uh, demand and resilience in the oil sector. All right. Uh, well, there are growing concerns that decisions at the ongoing uh, 2021 United Nations Climate Conference, you know, actually ending today, uh, might impact financing for oil and gas projects. To what extent uh, can the Petroleum Industry Act help Nigeria sufficiently, you know, curb this uh, possible impact? 
Yeah, basically, uh, I mean, uh, when you look at the conference, it's dominated by um, advanced economies of the world. Uh, these are countries that are, you know, very rich and uh, they have the power to impose, um, you know, policies that could affect investment in the oil space. I mean, uh, the issue of global, I mean, the greenhouse gas emission is not a new phenomenon that's been there for a while now, and there has been more aggressive action taken to ensure that the, uh, there's a reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases. I mean, this is going to really affect um, oil dependent economies like Nigeria in, in the sense that if you look at uh, our export base, Nigeria is largely dependent on oil, despite the fact that it contributes just a little uh, to the GDP. Uh, the oil contributes less than 10% to Nigeria's GDP. So um, it's going to have a negative impact. However, um, looking at the fact that we are talking about the global economy now, uh, there's a little that the PIA can do to reverse or to reduce the impact of this. Uh, but I think what Nigeria can focus on is um, tapping into the gas resources. Nigeria is rich in gas. In fact, um, when you look at Nigeria's gas reserve compared to the oil reserve, you will see Nigeria is gas rich and not oil rich. And given the fact that um, gas, uh, uh, gas is less uh, toxic to the atmosphere, I think that gas is going to outlive um, oil and other fossil fuel for maybe 50 to 100 years. And Nigeria could look at you know, strengthening investment in that sector by driving competitive policy and making sure that uh, the Nigerian business environment is, is one that allows um, uh, business to thrive. So with these, if Nigeria could quickly switch to uh, uh, more dependence, more reliance on, on gas than oil, uh, Nigeria will be able to withstand whatever change is going to happen, whatever impact is going to happen as a result of the decision that we made at the conference. But interestingly, I see uh, Germany is, is not uh, really in full support of uh, gas use. Uh, but going forward, uh, uh, let's see if other countries will actually join them, you know, with that uh, view. But recently, there, there was a report that the NNPC recorded a revenue deficit of uh, 1.29 trillion naira within the uh, nine months of 2021 period, as the national oil company recorded an actual uh, revenue of 2.44 trillion compared to a proposed annual revenue of about 4. Uh, 98 trillion. What is responsible for this uh, deficit? Yeah, uh, so basically, it's it's an oil company, the national oil company. So it's also dependent on uh, the level of production that we can see um, in that space. I mean, since the emergence of pandemic, that's why the fact that Nigeria's production has been said to be very low. We have seen uh, uh, the OPEC plus cartel gradually reversing its uh, decision to. And reduce supply, I mean, supply of oil drastically across um, among its members. And, you know, that's why the reverse how Nigeria has not been able to go back to pre pandemic levels. And that's why the fact that it's just um, uh, OPEC quota for Nigeria is 1.67 uh, million barrels per day. Nigeria has continued to produce below this level uh, because of uh, issues around the uh, uh, operational inefficiency. Excuse me, operational inefficiencies. I mean, this has really affected um, the ability of. Um, NPC to meet its revenue target. And uh, basically, if you look at the GDP, you will see the trend. Uh, Nigeria's um, oil GDP has you know, contracted for you know maybe three to four quarters consecutively. Now, I mean, if you look at the GDP, the last GDP for Q2 shows uh, over 20% contraction in production. So this has been the major factor why um, the NPC has not been able to really achieve its target despite increasing oil price. All right, and uh, bringing it to the crypto market now, we see it's witnessed you know, upbeat performance this week with Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, reaching uh, record highs. Is there any explanation as to the recent rally despite the, whole, uh, the, the, the very high uh, volatility we see in digital currency? Uh, yeah, basically, I mean, what has been supporting uh, the cryptocurrency market has been um, high system liquidity. With the emergence of um, the pandemic, a lot of economies were you know, supporting their, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of governments are supporting their economies with more system liquidity. And this has led to investors um, cherry picking on um, um, risky assets. Even equities market has been you know, recording very strong gains. Even if you look at the um, advanced economy, even um, other markets, you know, they have been rallying a lot um, this year. And it has been similar for uh, the cryptocurrency market. That's why the fact that the Chinese government uh, clamped down uh, uh, cryptocurrency activities. We saw that um, uh, the US Fed has several times uh, reiterated that it is not intended to um, halt the transactions on cryptocurrency. And you know, this has kind of um, driven back the positive sentiment for the, crypto, for the crypto market. And basically, we have seen sustained buying interest in that space. So I will attribute that uh, performance in the crypto market to um, all these factors which I mentioned. 
But is it is is uh, Bitcoin actually a, a good hedge against inflation, like in reality? Uh, well, I mean, if you look at it in the sense that um, um, if you look at the U.S. market, for instance, U.S. has started to report historic inflation numbers, and if you look at the, the crypto market performance, uh, you know. It has been quite bullish this year. It has outperformed the inflation numbers. And um, also, if you look at the fact that uh, government instruments are not um, yielding as much as they used to, given the easy policy stance of the, uh, the central banks across the world, this has led to investors looking for opportunity. However, the, um, if it has helped to, help, I mean, surpass that bit um, inflation in terms of return. However, it still remains volatile and you know, anything could happen in that space. Yeah, quite, quite volatile. Well, uh, let's uh, look at yields. Now, following the conclusion of the Treasury bill auction on Wednesday, uh, how would you describe the outcome and what is the possible impact on the uh, secondary fixed income market? You know, given a lot of investors have been on the sidelines to have more insight regarding uh, direction of yields. Uh, yeah, so basically what we saw at the close of uh, the auction was that um, the auction was oversubscribed and most demand went to the long end of the curve. And what we again saw was the uh, stock rate for the long end trending lower again you know, for the second consecutive time. And you know, I mean, investors pretty much um, watch closely what is happening around the money market space. And uh, with the result of the auction, we're likely going to see some bullish sentiment um, resurfacing in the uh, fixed income market generally. Already yesterday, we saw the bullish performance coming in. I advise right, it's not still clear because, I mean, we have seen mixed direction uh, from the um, central bank in recent time. And investors will still be looking at um, the auctions that will take place in order to be able to um, decide um, effectively whether or not um, yields are going to be trending lower or not in the fixed income market. All right. The, the equities market has been quite bullish uh, so far this week. Uh, we saw the resurfacing of buying interest across uh, bellwether stocks. What is your uh, assessment of the positive, you know, performance, and, and what are you what are you expecting? Yes. Yeah, so uh, basically, at the beginning of this week, uh, we saw that the central bank uh, approved um, the PSB license to telco giant Intel and um, MTN. And I mean, looking at what these um, uh, telco giants have done outside of Nigeria, I mean, investors were anticipating that uh, there's going to be a lot, you know, done. Um, in the Nigerian market, and basically we saw a lot of um, um, a lot of demand for those stocks. And uh, most of the gains that came into the market this week were from the telco giants, given their market size, you know, and the level of demand that we saw. So we saw both um, Etel and MTN gaining um, about 15% each, you know, due to the buying interest uh, in, in in those two tickets. However, we also saw buying interest in other the other stocks. Um, though uh, when you look at the results on Wednesday and Thursday, we saw. Uh, some profit taking in some investors were exiting um, stocks due to the fact that I mean they'll be able to uh, make some level of profit. So we saw some sell pressures on the market on Wednesday and Thursday. But overall, the market is still very bullish and it's likely going to close on a bullish note at the end of this week. But I mean, looking forward to next week, I think um, it, the performance is going to be missed for um, stocks that have witnessed a lot of sell offs like GT, Zenit. Um, we should see some buying interest in those stocks. Why for? You know, stocks that um, that have you know made some profits, we are going to likely see some pro uh, profit taking um, next week. So I mean, the performance is going to be mixed, but I mean, who wins will not depend on uh, which is stronger, maybe the bears or the bulls. Right. But well, looking at the uh, uh, performance this week, which uh, stocks uh, stood out for you? Yeah, I think um, uh, the stock that stood out for me has been MTN. I mean, MTN is. Uh, is a is the value stock and um, a lot of analysts have a view that um, MTN is um, likely on the value. And I mean, seeing this kind of news coming and um, investors taking position in it, I think um, you know people are recognizing um, the the um, the capacity of the stock to deliver a huge return for them. I mean, in both short and long run. So I would say MTN has you know stood out um, across all these stocks in the domestic bus. And and what are you looking? What stocks do you see? you know, looking good for, for next week? Oh, well, um, um, I think um, some banking stocks are attractive at the moment. Also, um, when you look at um, Jai's Bank, I mean, the, co the company has delivered very strong numbers, um, you know, for since the beginning of the year, even before, um, even in 2020, when we had a pandemic, you know, I think um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in um, in uh, Jai's Bank, also Zenit Bank, despite the fact that it, is, uh, it has posted 
um, uh, under on uh, a, a performance which is uh, below what was generally expected. And I think um, the GT at this level is still a good buy for the long run, especially when you consider the level of um, uh, dividend that um, GT Bank has declared um, um, in the long run now. So, I mean, if you expect that kind of dividend to be declared for full year 2021, I mean, it's a very attractive stock at the moment. Also, um, Zenit, Zenit is also an attractive name when you look at it in terms of dividend and also uh, UBA. So I think all these stocks um, have a potential for oppression in the coming week. All right, still, still looking at uh, you know uh, inflation hedges here. Uh, how strong is the equities uh, market if, if you want to use it to hedge against that uh, inflation? Yeah, so uh, basically, equities market is very good for inflation hedging. However, for you to be able to tap into that, um, I would advise that as an investor, uh, you look more of the long run. Um, so I mean, if you're taking position in, a, in an equity instrument that are not undervalued. And you see a potential for it to appreciate significantly, uh, maybe in the next uh, two to three years. I mean, those kind of stocks um, in the long run outperform inflation. And I think that, I mean, looking at the level of um, yields that are being offered at the uh, fixed income market at the moment, I think um, having an exposure to equities for a long run is going to prove positive for investors that can do, uh, that can have that kind of investment strategy to position um, in fundamentally justified stocks which I expected to uh, continue to deliver strong numbers, you know, in the long run. So I think, um, you know, if, if investors are able to find uh, fundamentally justified stocks for the long run, um, they will they'll be able to um, edge against some um, inflation. All right. Akin to Oyelako, investment analyst at Quadras uh, Asset Management. Thank you for uh, joining us on the program this morning. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much for having me. All right, sir. Uh, off to uh, Will now. Well, Will, how's it looking? Well, laddie, good morning. It's not so bright this morning, mm. especially yesterday when the market closed down 0.36%. The equities are not so, no, not thriving as we hoped, you know. Yeah. You bet on the green and we came out red yeah. and we we're hoping that Both Friday would... Both bets wrong. Yeah, you bet wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so negative sentiment persisted in the local bus as investors took profits off MTN, which was down 0.5% yesterday. And you know, the sell-off people... Well, Ladi, what can I say is we're nearing Christmas. Mm. People have to make money. People have to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. They got to buy gifts. Profit-taking. You know, Profit-taking, you know, <laughs> that's what's basically happening. So... The all share index is rightly at 43,549 point to eight a point. The market cap is currently at 22.726 trillion naira. And we're seeing the volume was, it was a sea of red for the activity chart. The volume was down to 161.3 million units, a value 2.14 million billion naira, and executed in 3,574 deals. We're going to quickly shift to the fixed income market where. Bullish sentiments seem to have returned there, and uh, we're, we, 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 maybe we'll de Degunam is a fixed income dealer, is on standby to tell us what's going on there, especially with the uh, NTB auction where we saw uh, in Wednesday's uh, 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 trading session. Good morning, Dumebi. Uh, good morning, really. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to have you too. Um, We've observed, um, like we said, the especially for the NTB auction, a reduction in the stop rate for the long tenor bill, the 364 paper. It was down by 46 basis points. Uh, will this be the trend going forward? Because we observed that in the other, the last uh, NTB auction as well. Yeah, so this might be the trend going forward to close the to close the year. So notice the as the rates kept on reducing, we noticed that they kept on selling more. A very good example is this last auction. You know, they were intended to sell out they were almost offered was one hundred and fifty billion, but they sold one ninety six billion and they dropped the rate. So this is a good way to manage, you know, the rate currently and also a good way to more or less raise more money going forward. So we expect to see this trend going forward to probably even close the year. If you notice the Previous auctions or the last few auctions where we've seen drop in rates, you know, from where we're coming from 6.9 to 6.5, we've, we've seen that trading from the 7.25, 6.9, 6.5. So this is the trend, and obviously this trend will continue to close the year. So now we'll, we'll, let's just talk about the FX market for a little bit. The Naira rose uh, a bit bullish at the parallel market, especially it was um, it was up against the dollar. Are we seeing, is there a sign of more foreign direct investment in the country? What's your take on that? 
And well, if, if, if two things, our FX market is generally ruled by the, the, the demand and supply mechanisms. We've seen a drop in the demand this year and an increase and an uptick in supply in the market. That's how we're seeing that drop. So we, we expect that, however, on the side of inflows, yes, I must confess that we've seen an increase in inflows or FPI in Texas into the economy. I think like for the month for Q4, the inflows into local companies and market has increased by 119%. The figure stands at about 19 billion now compared to the previous quarter of 8.9 billion. So that's a very good positive growth for the economy. And we expect to see the stable trading of the of the exchange rate and a further decline going to close the year. So what's your outlook? You just mentioned that what of liquidity now we've seen the FDI inflows coming in. Um auctions taking place, people buying, taking positions. What's your outlook for next week in terms of liquidity? Well, for next week, we only we have a maturity coming in. We have about 72 billion coming in in Omo maturity next week. So we expect, in terms of liquidity trading, we expect the market to be a big size. And we also have a bond auction on the 17th on Wednesday, where about 150 billion will be, will be offered on the 2026. 27 and 2050. So that's where a lot of participants will be paying attention to. So we will see that also play in the sentiment of the market. We will see more cautious trading and also we expect you know, market budget to play into the hands of them where they might probably drop rates to cost. You know, we've seen a trend from the NCD auction. So we expect the exact same trend to play also in the bond auction. Thank you so much, Dumebi, for your insights on the program. That's uh, Dumebi Udegon. I'm the fixed income dealer at uh, UBA. Uh, so, Ladi, uh, back to you now. Yeah. All right, well, uh, fingers crossed for the e uh, weekly close. I'm not giving any bets today. <laughs> <laughs> Please just place a bet. <laughs> uh, okay. Green. Okay. I'll take you over. All right. <laughs> All right, Will. Thank you so much. Well, after the break, we'll take a quick, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll uh, do an opening call to London. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. Now for some developments in London, we have Juliana. Great to have you, Juliana. Well, uh, Britain's uh, hopes to grab a slice of the fast-growing market for uh, electric uh, vehicle batteries have been uh, dealt a blow after one of UK's biggest chemical companies said I would give up on developing the technology. What's the issue here? Uh, good morning, Laddie. Yeah, this is a pretty embarrassing um, uh, set of announcement by Jonathan, Johnson Mathy, which is a 204-year-old British firm, um, which is one of the world's uh, leaders when it comes to developing st sustainable technologies. Um, just a few months ago, um, they had a big partnership with the British government. It was endorsed by the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, um, to develop uh, batteries uh, for electric vehicles. We know that this is a market that is um, really dominated uh, by the Koreans and China. So this would have been the first time that Britain could solidify uh, their place in that market. Well, just this morning, um, the firm have announced that they're putting out um, of the electric uh, battery vehicle market. Um, it's a huge uh, business story. It sent their shares plunging 18%. It's actually wiped about a billion pound off their market capitalization because, of course, um, this is COP26 week. The final draft text is being produced as we speak. And um, it's really important uh, that Britain and lots of the G7 nations prepare themselves uh, for this clean transition. And using electric vehicles is part of that. I do have a brief statement from Jonathan and Matthew. They said that following a detailed review ahead of reaching a number of critical investment milestones, it, the, the business had concluded that potential returns from its battery materials business would not be adequate to justify further investment. Um, I believe just a couple of months ago, they said they were going to be putting £600 million towards this investment. It was going to create tens of thousands of jobs. So yes, um, this uh, last minute pullout is really seen as a huge embarrassment for Boris Johnson's Conservative government. Yeah, quite a big blow there. Uh, well, let's look at uh, some transport uh, stories now. Uh, Boeing admits uh, full responsibility for the 737 MAX uh, plane crash in Ethiopia. Seems, uh, seems like there's hope for affected families to actually get uh, compensation now. 
Yeah, although it's pretty, um, it's, it's important to, to clarify that uh, the ruling in America overnight um, doesn't open, it doesn't, it's not, uh, compensation isn't part of that ruling, but um, now victims, um, family members are able to um, apply for compensation or, in fact, criminal proceedings in America and not in their host nation. I believe there were 33 different nationals um, that died. Um, there was 157 um, individuals, but I believe they're from 33 different countries that died in March 2019 following that devastating 737 Boeing Max uh, crash. This was, in fact, the second time uh, the 737 had crashed in just six months. Of course, it caused absolute outcry and outrage across the industry. In fact, the, the, you know, the plane was um, grounded for a couple of years. It's only recently that some countries, not all, uh, started using uh, that plane again. But yes, this definitely opens the door um, for families. Of course, it's not enough. Um, no compensation just yet, but at least uh, they can file for some sort of compensation in um, Illinois, I believe. Right, quite a sad uh, story there. Anyway, Juliana, thank you so much uh, for the update. We'll talk to you later on Business Corporated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's uh, look at the crypto market now. Uh, we see Bitcoin has started a downside uh, correction below 66,000 and 65,000 levels. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the uh, market cap now. You see the market cap there having a little pullback. And prices, uh, the price of Bitcoin uh, trading now at $66,000 and the hourly uh, 100 uh, simple moving average just uh, above it. We we'll see the market cap there, $2.84 trillion. It's uh, up 0.18%, 24-hour uh, volume in the total crypto market, uh, down 29% this morning. Bitcoin dominance at 43.20%. Uh, let's look at the price of Bitcoin there. We we'll see uh, Bitcoin trading about uh, 64,000, had that uh, major pullback down 0.8%. Uh, 0.3%, 24 hour $35.52 billion traded in Bitcoin this morning. Let's uh, bring in Michael and Najee now, a digital market analyst to bring us up speed. Great to have you, Michael. Thank God it's Friday. Hello. Happy, happy Friday, Hello, Thank you happy, so much for having me. Happy Friday, Michael. Well, I, I see that uh, a, a CPI comes at a headline at uh, 6.2%, and then Bitcoin tops at about uh, $69 thousand dollars minutes after. Is the market trying to signal something here? Uh, I, I, I would I would I would like to say so. Um, I, I think uh, I definitely would like to think so, um, because at the end of the day, um, this is the first time that you're seeing uh, Bitcoin getting uh, in times of when there's clear indications that we're having inflation. Uh, you're seeing it uh, signal as a uh, as a hedge. Uh, for most market participants. Um, this is the first time in a very long time that we've seen uh, this trade play out. Um, usually in times like this, it would have been gold. That would have been the darling uh, play. Uh, but uh, right now it's Bitcoin. And the reason why it's Bitcoin is because of the inflation numbers. Uh, it's because when you actually look at uh, uh, at uh, the CPI numbers, um, it's at 6.2%. But when you look at it, uh, in the, when it uh, with the 1980s methodology by a website called Shadow Stats, you realize it's somewhere close to, I think, closer to 15%. And so what you realize is um, the S&P compounds are something closer to 7% uh, annually, uh, sorry, 14% annually for the past uh, 20 years. So effectively, you have the S&P 500 um, increasing at the rate of money supply, and you have gold practically doing nothing in the last decade. And there's only one asset that's uh, returning uh, levels much higher than any other thing that's out there, and that's Bitcoin. And so that's why you're seeing um, money uh, pour out from equities, money pour out from bonds, and go into Bitcoin. Um, because even at a 2% or 5% allocation, uh, if Bitcoin, if, if, if Bitcoin does become a, a monetary asset that becomes a store of value for the world, you, you end up seeing it go to this um, very large store of value for the world. And at the end of the day, it, it's, it's one of the few ways uh, you can hedge your portfolio against uh, the massive uh, inflation that's coming. And in a place like Nigeria, where inflation is closer to something like I would personally think 40 to 50 percent. Uh, it's very obvious um, why you need Bitcoin. 
because it compounds to something close to 200% a year. So after you take away inflation, you're still left with 150% of appreciation. So yes, 100%, um, the, the inflation trade is Bitcoin. Um, people like Mark, uh, Paul Tudor Jones have been saying this, um, that if the Fed chooses not to raise rates, because if they raise rates, um, they're going to effectively make uh, the debt servicing harder for them. Um, okay. So they're just going to in increase the uh, monetary supply and, and, and try and tax away uh, whatever they can. Uh, but well, Bitcoin definitely is, is the inflation trade. Right. And if I remember correctly, 2017, when it had that bull run uh, till 2018, got as high as about $20,000, then pulled back all the way to $3,000. If we get another bear market, is it is, is Bitcoin still a good inflation hedge? Um, yes, because uh, uh, when you account for the actual M2 money supply, um, uh, in terms of the actual growth of the money supply, the all-time high for Bitcoin, um, to actually break it, we need to hit about $80,000. So when you account for the, the growth of the money supply, M2 divided by Bitcoin, basically, what you actually realize is when we break $80,000, only then have we broken the previous all-time high. So if you account for all the money they've printed, we still haven't even reached the top yet. So even though it does have heavy volatility, at the end of the day, there's only a handful of assets. And one of them is Bitcoin that will get you out of this mess. Right. Okay, Michael, where do you see Bitcoin topping out? Uh, right In now- In this bull um, market. We, yeah, right now we definitely, um, uh, uh, right now, there's uh, you have um, you have open interest at all-time highs. Uh, you have all sorts of indications that there should be some kind of flush out in the short term, uh, because right now you have all-time highs, inflation triggers. So you should see some profit taking from that run-up that we had. Uh, but that's not discounting the fact that we could go much higher. I'm targeting at least between 120 to 160 thousand um, dollars in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, this is uh, being conservative. I'm pushing it out all the way out to Q2 of next year, uh, meaning like June of next year, you should see us topping somewhere closer to 140, 160,000. Well, if that's I'm being a, big a little number, bit more optimistic, <laughs> yeah, if you, want to, if you want to be a little bit more optimistic, look for a quarter million to $300,000 per Bitcoin, depending on how much pertinent inflation becomes and how much Bitcoin eats of that market share and idea share of people's minds and right. how much they are willing to put on that trade. Okay, Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm watching uh, your prediction. When that time comes, I'll remind you. <laughs> All right, Thank Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. Enjoy your weekend. All right, uh, that's it uh, for the program for the week. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Remember, you can still join us at 1.30 uh, for Business Incorporated for more uh, updates uh, and developments in the world of business. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy your weekend. Bye for now.